Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday on this rainy Saturday at a morning in New York City. Uh, welcome, everybody, everybody on the replay. Um, today's topic is going to be on irritable bowel syndrome. And we're going to talk about whether this is uh, a diagnosis or is this uh, just a symptom. And, uh, you know, there's millions of people that are diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome or have irritable bowel syndrome and don't know that they have it, but they have these symptoms of, uh, you know, having to run to the bathroom urgently, a lot of cramps, loose stool, um, and uh, not feeling well in their stomach all the time, kind of like a sick stomach. And so it's it's probably more common than, than not, and uh, a lot of people... Uh, neglect to go to their uh, doctors um, about it because they just think, oh, it's something that I ate or something that's bothering my stomach. And um, so um, I'm going to talk today and do a real in-depth uh, talk on my feelings on uh, irritable bowel syndrome and what you can do about it and how you can kind of get the real diagnosis behind it. So Hey, Mario and Val, how are you? My two Italian friends, join, the first to join me. So, uh, yeah, so irritable bowel syndrome is, is kind of, like I said, it's, it's very common. And, and there's two main types. There's irritable bowel syndrome with uh, mostly constipation and irritable bowel syndrome with uh, mostly loose stool or diarrhea. So one of the things that gets me the most angry about, um, about Irritable bowel syndrome is that um, that there's just blanket statements when you see these commercials for medications. Well, if you have irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, we'll stop the constipation. And if you have irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, we'll stop the diarrhea. And, you know, it's just so typical of traditional medicine of here's a diagnosis or here's a symptom. And... You know, we're going to treat this symptom, but we're not going to get down to the underlying cause. So, um, hey, Ronnie, what's up? Hey, Joe, nice. Thank you for joining me. Um, so, you know, that's what really gets me upset is that, that irritable bowel syndrome, more than any other symptom or, or diagnosis, is just so ingrained in, hey, you have diarrhea? Well, we're going to give you something to give you less diarrhea. If you have... Uh, if you have constipation, we're going to give you something to aid the constipation. Hi, Julie. How are you? Um, so, you know, it, it's just it's just a very typical, you know, treat treat this symptom and not get, get to the root of the diagnosis. Now, the reason why I'm so passionate about this is that, um, good morning, Nelson, uh, that I myself have had these symptoms, and I know a lot of my patients have had them. and it's it's really important to get to the root of the problem. So that's why I named this talk Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Is it really a diagnosis or is it a symptom? Well, my belief is that it's really a symptom of something else. So if you're having these symptoms, these bowel and you know your bowels are not right, it's really important to look out into it and not to just say, oh, I have IBS. So the differential diagnosis of this is very important you need to rule out a couple of things. One is the other IBS, which is inflammatory bowel syndrome. And that's uh, known as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Now, those are pretty easy to distinguish. Those almost tip, almost always, they typically have um, blood and you'll have some type of blood in your stool. There'll be a lot more mucus in your stool. But again, um, I'm going to talk about a case study in a little while that even those diagnoses need to be further investigated with some sophisticated um, testing that could sometimes uncover another underlying issue. And, and uh, I think you'll be very interested in the case study that I'm going to go over. So you have to rule out Crohn's. You have to rule out um, inflammatory bowel disease. You have to rule out... Um, uh, colon cancer, which again, if you're, it's really a concern if you're over 40 or if you have a, a strong family history. But uh, 
again, colon cancer symptoms are typically not going to go away. So if you have these symptoms and you change your diet or you do something to take care of it and your symptoms go away, then you don't have to worry about colon cancer. Colon cancer is something that is going to be progressive. It's going to keep moving on. So let's talk about what is considered healthy pooping. So, well, it can vary. So healthy, healthy stool should be typically on the average person. It's, it's, it's moving your bowels anywhere from one to three times a day. And uh, it, it depends on the consistency of your stool. And I'm so sure you've all seen the poop charts with all the different types of poop. But in general, you know, your stool should be formed. It should be free of mucus. It should be free of blood. It shouldn't be black like tar, which is a sign of bleeding. And, um, you know, it should be pretty regular. Like you should be going t similar times every day, depending on what and how you eat. Now, if you notice that, you know, every time I eat such and such food, or if I get nervous, my stomach bothers me and I have to run to the bathroom, or you have to run to the bathroom constantly throughout the day, regardless of what you eat and you can't figure it out, then you may have an underlying issue. So um, let's talk about the functions of the bowel and why this is so important. Um, as many of you probably already know, your, most of your immune cells and immune system comes from inside your bowels. So there's these pyres, patches, and other pockets of massive amounts of immune cells that are produced in your gut. And the reason those are there is because when you ingest stuff, and ger even if it's germs and you ingest foods and allergens, they go through your gut, and that's really the first place that you're going to be exposed to. So it's a smart, way, uh, it's a smart place. It's like a port of entry. If you're guarding, if you're guarding a, uh, uh, a, a nation, right, you're going you're gonna to guard the port of entry. So the port of entry typically is your bowels. So that's where your, most of your immune system lies. And if your bowels aren't healthy and aren't functioning properly, then there's a very good chance that your immune system is also not functioning properly. So that's why, um, you know, myself and other doctors that, pr that practice integrative medicine are so um, concerned about people that do not have normal bowel movements. So one of the biggest culprits of, of poorly functioning bowels is antibiotic use. So I'm just going to digress here for a little while and talk about why, in, 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 in general, why is it that every pediatrician, you know, besides a few, are overloading our children with antibiotics. My son the other day clearly has a cold. I have a little bit of a cold. He has a runny nose and a cough and congestion and an earache and a headache. And so this is typically a cold. So he goes to the doctor, I'm at work, he goes to the doctor, and the doctor prescribes, says, he has a red ear, he has an ear infection, I'm going to give him antibiotics. And I'm like, yes, he has an ear infection, but it's a viral ear infection. And as we know, antibiotics do not work on viruses. So I got him a natural treatment for his ear, and I uh, used a tea tree oil, and, um, and his ear will be fine. So Again, but this is a common thread. What people need to realize, and especially pediatricians, is that a bacterial infection is a very clear-cut focused infection. Like strep throat, you have a sore throat, you may have a headache, but you're not going to have a runny nose, you're most likely not going to have congested ears, you're not going to have a cough, you're going to have a sore throat and a high fever. Okay, if you have an ear infection that's bacterial, you're going to have a painful ear and a fever. You're not going to have the runny nose. You're not going to have all the other symptoms. These are called constitutional symptoms. Runny nose, cough, minor sore throat, ear pain, ear congestion. Those are all the signs of a, of a virus. Viruses attack the whole respiratory system. They work their way down, and they are not able to be treated with antibiotics. The reason that's important is every time you take an antibiotic, you are killing a good portion of your immune system. When your immune system is, is navigated and, and managed by billions of bacteria that are in your gut. And here's a fun fact. There is actually more bacteria. You have more bacteria in your body and in your gut than you have cells in your body. So think about that. That's how critical and crucial what we call the microbiome is in your gut, that, um, that it actually it 
dictates your, how your whole body functions. So there's more microbiology, microbiological organism living in your body than there, you have cells in your body. So that's a really, really important point. And I just see that there's so many people that are, you know, are getting antibiotics every time they, uh, you know, every time they go to the doctor, they get an antibiotic. I'm just going to say some highs. Hi, Amy. Hi, Vito. Nelson. Um, Rob Safoli. What's up, my man? Sister Donna Joe And Anthony, very nice for you to join me. So, uh, again, you know, I just see it time after time. People go with cold symptoms and, you know, they get an antibiotic and it's just killing their immune system. So, uh, Val just asked a question. This is great, Val, because it's just brings me right to my next point. If and when you do need an antibiotic, do you recommend taking a probiotic? Yes, you need to take a probiotic and you need to take it during your antibiotic treatment and after your antibiotic treatment. And depending on the antibiotic uh, will determine the duration of, tr of probiotic. It's not a bad idea to take a probiotic on a regular basis anyhow. Um, I think it's great for your immune system. And I will, um, at the end of this talk, give my suggestions on how you should choose a probiotic. And if I forget, somebody remind me. But that's, it's very important, but I'm sure I'll get to it. So now I want to just do something I haven't done before. I'm going to give you a little case study. This case study is about probably 10 years old. So I saw an 18-year-old uh, young man um, who was uh, very near and dear to me. He was uh, playing college football. And he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So uh, he went through every treatment. He suffered. He was hospitalized. He lost tons of weight. Uh, he tried every treatment. He tried steroids, which always made him sick. Anti tons of antibiotics, which always made him sick. And then he was given a treatment called mercaptopurine, um, uh, which is almost like a, a chemotherapy agent. Well, that almost killed him and knocked out his immune system. It did nothing for his Crohn's. So he was 18 years old, I think maybe 19, again, a college, co great college athlete. And um, he was told that he had to have uh, the majority of his um, bowel removed. So he came to me and he said, you know, listen, Rich, is there anything that you could do? And he was living actually in Maryland at the time. So I said, you know, come down. You could stay with me. Um, I want, I, I need a couple of days to do some testing on you and I want to put you in a hyperbaric chamber just to calm down the inflammation, um, in your bowel. So we had a soft hyperbaric, low pressure hyperbaric chamber in the office that I was working out of. And I'll give a shout out to Dr. David Dornfeld, who still has, uh, his practice there and is uh, my, my mentor and still does hyperbaric therapy. So if you're interested in that, definitely uh, look up family wellness center, Dr. Dornfeld the smartest doctor I know uh, and, the, and the most wonderful doctor that I, that I know um, turned me on to this. So we put him in the hyperbaric chamber, which almost immediately helped his symptoms. But we also what we did was a comprehensive, it's called the CDSA. Unfortunately, it's not available in New York. It is available in most other states. Uh, for some, it's from a reason in New York, there's a licensing issue with the company. But um, it's a company called Doctors Data, and there's some other uh, labs that do it called uh, Great Plains. But it's basically a culture, and it's a thorough culture. It's a, it's, it's a swab of the bowels. You send out a stool sample. You may send it in the mail in a package, gets sent out, and they actually grow it. So it takes, you know, it takes a couple of weeks for, for this to get this test results back because it's actually growing all of the flora in your bowel. So it tells you how much good bacteria you have, what species, how much bad bacteria you have, how much good yeast, how much bad yeast. Now they take all of that information and they, and they put it on, on a chart. And it tells you not only what the bad bacteria is, it tells you both what natural treatments you can use to treat it and both what antibiotics you can use to treat it or other therapies. So this is like the hallmark if you have IBS you need to get this test. And if you live in New York, then you probably need to go see a doctor that, um, that does this in New Jersey. Good morning, Danielle. Good morning, Marie. And good morning, my brother, John. Thank you for joining me. So getting back to the case study. So now I have this 18-year-old kid and uh, about to get his bowels, you know, most of his bowels removed. He's in the hyperbaric chamber, goes back home after a couple of days of therapy. He's feeling better. He comes back, we get the results of the um, CDSA. 
Well, it turns out that he has a rip-roaring yeast infection in his bowels, like tremendous amounts of yeast and almost no good bacteria. So I consult with Dr. Dornfeld. We decide that we're going to um, put him on uh, uh, an actual antifungal medication, which is um, which was one that is called nystatin. And nystatin, the interesting thing about that, it's not absorbed orally. So you can actually drink it. It will treat what's in the bowels, but it doesn't get into your system. So you don't have to worry about any organ damage or toxicity. So, and, and that, the test revealed that it was, it was in fact, um, it was in fact uh, sensitive to nystatin. We put him on a, 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 a ton of probiotics. We put him on a good healthy yeast, something called Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces is actually one of the good yeasts. So you, just like you have good bacteria in your bowel, you also have good yeast. So we put him on a, a strict regimen. We continued his hyperbaric therapy. And um, within a couple of days, if I tell you within a couple of days, his symptoms had completely resolved. This is a kid that was suffering from this for several years. Again, was scheduled for surgery of his bowels, had taken chemotherapy, which almost killed him. And we literally treated him with a medication that cost about $8 and gave him some probiotics. And guess what? His symptoms never returned. He went back to his doctor who was going to open up his bowels. And his doctor said, well, I guess you brought, you've never had Crohn's disease to begin with. So, you know, my, my, you know what my answer is on that. So, um, so you were, you weren't sure enough. You weren't sure enough of the diagnosis that you were going to cut somebody open and remove an eighteen-year-old child's bowels. But you know now you're questioning your diagnosis. But anyway, to make a long story short, he is doing very well. He's prospering. He did actually have some other lingering medical issues, most from the other drugs that he took, like the um, captopurine. But overall, he's doing very well. He's married, you know, baby on the way, and and, and doing extremely well. And so um, that's why it's so, por so important to never take a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome or e even inflammatory bowel syndrome without doing these other tests. So, um, you know, and I've seen countless others. This was just the most extreme, but people who have been told they have Crohn's or they've told they have IBS, and then they come to me, we run some simple tests, re really, literally some simple tests, and, and we figure out what they have. So to me, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, let's forget about Crohn's, forget about um, other inflammatory bowel syndrome. But if you have a diagnosis of IBS, everything else has been ruled out. There are only two causes in my mind. One is food allergies. And that's very important because people just typically think that food allergies cause rashes and, and, and they cause, um, you know, maybe a little bit of upset stomach and, and cause uh, hives, but food allergies can cause serious havoc in your bowels. And again, when your bowels are affected, your immune system is affected. So if you have food allergies and you have a lot of stomach system symptoms associated with that, you're also going to have immune, immune system uh, problems as well. So, so that's the first cause is, um, is food allergies. The second cause, if you have IBS and pay attention, is something called dysbiosis. Okay, so dysbiosis is just a name for an imbalance of good bacteria and bad bacteria in your bowels. So we know that we have we're supposed to have, we have billions of good bacteria that act as a police and they keep the balance of the flora inside your gut. Occasionally, Mostly after antibiotic therapy, there becomes a discrepancy or uh, an imbalance of good bacteria to bad bacteria. So now you take an antibiotic, it wipes out your good bacteria, kills some of the bad bacteria, but now the bad bacteria is always going to grow faster and now start to flourish. The same thing happens with yeast, especially if you're eating a lot of carbs and a lot of sugar. You have yeast in your bowel. If you don't have these good bacteria around to control the um, to, to be the police, you're going to get an overgrowth of bad bacteria. Good morning, Anne-Marie, Janice. Thank you, Marie. Um, thank you for joining me. I uh, greatly appreciate it. I love doing this. Um, so if you have IBS, you have one of two things. You have dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of bacteria in your bowels, or you have food allergies. So how do we tackle this? Well, the easiest thing to do would be to try to tackle 
I like to send uh, CDSA or, com or comprehensive digestive and stool analysis to everybody because that's that analysis out actually will also give me information if they're seeing changes in the bowel of uh, allergy related inflammation. So again, that's a great test. And then we just do an elimination diet. So the first thing we do is a detox, right? We, we eliminate all, all of the common allergens. You eliminate alcohol, you eliminate sugar, you eliminate gluten, dairy, um, and grains, right? So it's like you're doing a regular detox, and then you start adding back one food type at a time. You may want to add back beans, you want to add back rice, and you give that every three days. And after every three days, if you don't have these bowel symptoms returning, then you know that you're not allergic to that food. Now, um, you can get blood tests, and there are blood tests for um, celiac, which is a gluten allergy. But again, not everybody has celiac, but you could still be sensitive to gluten without having celiac disease. And I'm going to digress a little bit on this point as well. But most of the celiac disease or gluten sensitivities, you see everybody has to be gluten-free now, right? Everybody wants to be gluten-free and, and has sensitivities to gluten. But I've done experiments on this with my own patients. It's not the gluten that you're allergic to. It's the man-made gluten that you're allergic to. If you look at the wheat molecule and you look at an organic wheat molecule, they look like two totally different plants, right? And so it's when they started genetically modifying the wheat that we started becoming allergic to it. Now, the other thing about genetically modified foods is they're genetically modified to resist dying from Roundup, essentially, right? So you, we know about the toxicity of Roundup. It's been in the news, how it causes cancer, yet this is what they're spraying on the foods. And a genetically modified food is genetically resistant to, to being sprayed with Roundup. What does that mean? They're adding more pesticide to the food, and, they're, and, and the pesticide also is causing bowel damage as well. So that's why it's so important to eat organic produce, right? And you should know about the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. It's a list that you could look up. The Dirty Dozen are the 10 most or 15 most commonly uh, uh, heavily sprayed pesticides foods, and the Clean 15 are the least heavily sprayed pesticide foods. So those are really, really important things. Um, so the thing about uh, you know GMOs is that if you eat or typically if you have gluten sensitivity and now I'm not talking about uh, celiac but if you think you're sensitive to gluten try eating organic gluten so if there's something that says or like a organic bread okay so if you try if you eat organic bread I guarantee you you will not have the same symptoms um, if you go to Italy and eat a bowl of pasta in Italy and you eat a bowl of pasta in America chances are that you're not going to have a problem in Italy. Why? Because Italy has already outlawed GMOs. So the the this gluten sensitivity craze that's that's taken over America is all because of the man-made gluten. And I strongly suggest that you guys do some research on this. Hey, Jeremy, great. Thank you for joining me. Long time no see. Um, Anne Marie, Liz, thank you, everybody. Um, so it's the man-made gluten. So that's usually the biggest culprit. So now. The good news is, is you don't necessarily have to eliminate all gluten products and be gluten free. If you're going to eat gluten, make sure it's organic or at least non-GMO gluten, and I guarantee you, you will have much less of a problem or no problem at all. So, <clears throat> addressing the food allergies, you want to systematically add back foods after you've taken back all possible allergy foods. And I'll usually give my clients a list of foods that are low allergy and they start with that. It's called an elimination diet. And then we add back foods and we add back foods and you'll, you'll notice that, oh, I ate that bagel, my symptoms of IBS came back. So that's a very simple way. And I would say in 50 or 60% of the time, um, foods are definitely the main culprit of irritable bowel syndrome. So even if you have IBS and it's not really you know, devastating your life, but it's embarrassing. You go to work, you have to run to the bathroom after lunch or whatever it is. It's, it's triggering that there's a problem in your bowel. And the reason, again, that's so important is if your bowels aren't healthy, your immune system isn't healthy. Good morning, Anthony Napolitano, Dina. Thank you for joining me. So uh, that's the reason why it's so important. So now I want to spend a little bit more time on dysbiosis. 
because this is a big culprit. And yeast overgrowth in the body can cause so many things. One of the things that I learned when I used to do, when I used to attend autism conferences, because a lot of autistic kids respond very well to gluten-free diets. And the reason is, is they found that, that this yeast that overgrows in your bowel actually sends signals. The yeast that's living in your bowel will actually send signals to your brain to make you crave sugar. So if you crave sugar and you can't lose weight and you think that you may have a yeast issue, get yourself tested because the yeast is actually smarter than you are. It's almost like that movie Men in Black when they open up the guy's brain and there's a little guy in there controlling the brain. Well, think of the yeast as like this, you know, this powerful um, entity in your body that's actually controlling, you know, what you eat and and what you know what you crave so because the yeast thrives on sugar yeast sends a signal to the brain and you eat more sugar you can't stop you craving more sugar you eat a lot of carbs and the yeast is able to live so that's why it's so important to know if you have yeast in your mouth and again this test probably costs about 150 dollars some insurances cover it depending on your symptoms um, even if it's not, it's worth the $200 if you're suffering from this to get the comprehensive digestive and stool analysis. Um, again, uh, there's two, two um, major labs that do it that I use. One is a Great Plains Laboratory and Doctors Data. Two great labs. It's science. It's not a hokey test. It's actually a real culture. It grows out all the good bacteria, all the bad bacteria. So it's a great test. So you... Now you get this, this test and you find out that you have an imbalance. You may have some yeast, you may have too little bacteria of certain species, and it'll actually name the species that you're lacking. So when you're looking for a probiotic, you could actually say, I need, you know, lactobacillus. So you could actually go and you could buy, you know, it'll give you a one through five rating on what each of your good bacteria is. And you'll say, okay, I need aspergillus and I need, uh, I need, um, I need lactobacillus, and you'll find the probiotic that contains that. So you treat that. Now, there's something else that you have to also keep in mind that you need what's called a prebiotic as well. I'm going to keep this simple. Um, uh, one of the main ingredients in a prebiotic is something called inulin, but there's other prebiotics as well. Apple cider vinegar actually works as a prebiotic um, and somewhat of a probiotic, especially if you get the fermented one. So um, a prebiotic is just something that creates a favorable environment in your bowel so that the good bacteria can grow. So you may have a very acidic bowel or a very unfavorable, um, you know, milieu of, of bacteria in there. And, and so if you don't take the prebiotic and you take a, and you, and you have this unfavorable living quarters for the good bacteria, you could take all the probiotic you want. It's not going to work. So if you've had failure on probiotics, you may look want to look into taking a prebiotic first. Good morning, Joe DeLeo, Carlos Lynn. Thank you for joining me. So those are the things that you want to look at. You want to take a prebiotic to get your bowel in good shape, and there's a lot of good products that I recommend. If you inbox me after this, I'd be more than happy to share some of the products that I recommend. I try not to share specific brand names, but there are a lot of good ones out there that I recommend. Um, and so let's talk about probiotics now. Uh, the, the proper way, there's no best probiotic, okay? So, like for this test, if you have a specific bacteria that you're lacking, then, yeah, you're going to take the one that you're, you're missing. But in general, your probiotics, the, two things, they should have, you know, billions of a specific microorganism. The more microorganisms in the billions they have, the more diversity, the better the probiotic. In general, most probiotics should be refrigerated because it's a live culture. Uh, there are some products out there, very few, that don't need to be refrigerated, but it's um, very minimal. Chris, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, Camille, uh, thanks for joining me. So uh, the, the probiotic, let's say you're just taking a probiotic for general health. The best way to take a probiotic is just to vary it. So in other words, one month, you're going to take a probiotic that contains, you know, probiotics, bacteria, A, B, C, and D. And it may have a lot of these bacteria. Then the next month, every probiotic is different, has a different um, uh, species in it, you know, has different 
no probiotic is the same. So some may have five of one back, you know, five billion of one bacteria, four billion in another, and then another probiotic may have totally different flora in it. So my suggestion is that every month, as long as you're buying a good quality probiotic, rotate them. Get because as many different species as you can have in your bowel of the good bacteria, because there's thousands of different types, the better you are and the more likely you are to replace what's missing, right? Because even that, the test that I recommended doesn't always, you know, grow every single type of bacteria. It's, it would be impossible because there's thousands. So the more variety that you give yourself, the better. So that's why it's important to vary your probiotics. So every month when you run out, try a new brand. As long as it's refrigerated, it's high quality, has billions of colonies, then, you know, then you, you I would rotate them. Unless you are doing really well on a specific probiotic and your symptoms are kind of continually progressively getting better, then you may want to stay that on that one a little bit longer. But when then when things kind of level off, I would switch again and, and, and take a different probiotic. So these these you know this diagnosis, this simple you know diagnosis that everybody's given, you know, I you have IBS. IBS again. IBS is a symptom, it is not a diagnosis. If you have been diagnosed with IBS, you either have food allergies or you have dysbiosis. And in my 25 years of doing nutrition-based medicine, I can tell you that, you know, 99% of the time it's one of those two. You know, sometimes you have inflammatory bowel disease, but again, those are easy to recognize because you're gonna have blood in the stool and a lot of mucus. You may have fevers associated with it. And again, that's easy to distinguish on a colonoscopy. But if you just simply have chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, you know, chronically running to the bathroom, not feeling well, your stomach's always upset, then you need to see somebody. You could see a health coach like myself um, that can talk you through it, get you directed to the, the, to, the, to the proper testing and then work with you nutritionally. Because again, it's, it's funny that both of these conditions can be treated 95% of the time without using a prescription medication. Um, for example, a lot of the times the yeast that's in your bowel is sensitive to, um, it'll be sensitive to nystatin, but it'll also be sensitive to oil of oregano. So you could literally treat the infection with oil of oregano and you're not guessing because you have a culture and a sensitivity. So they literally took that yeast that they grew in a Petri dish and they put a couple of drops of oil of oregano in there and it killed the yeast. Then they may have tried, you know, some other natural therapy. Let's say, um, I'm trying to think of some others, like let's say garlic, right? And they tried that and it didn't kill the yeast. So they will tell you, in this test exactly what worked and what didn't work so you're not guessing this is science so any doctor that tells you oh i don't believe in that test you would say oh you don't believe in a culture of the stool you know you don't believe in actually growing out what's in the bowels you're just guessing who's the one that's guessing i'm not guessing i have a culture so if you're if you've been diagnosed with ibs again it's, it's not a diagnosis, it's a symptom. If you have IBS, you have either dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of good and bad bacteria, which is really important to treat because it's affecting your immune system, or you have food allergies. Now there, I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on a test that you can get done for food allergies. There's lots of different allergies that you have to foods and, and other substances. So uh, food allergies, there's uh, different types of um, Immunoglobulins. You have I, immuno, immunoglobulin A, IgA, which and IgE, which are the typical allergy responses. They cause histamine release. They cause hives and rashes and discomfort. Right you, when your throat closes and you have those types of allergies, like the peanuts, those are IgE and IgA type allergies. IgA is especially specific for the gut. So if we see a high IgA in the comprehensive digestive and stool analysis, then it's typically that you may have an um, allergic gut. But the real allergy test to get, which is not commonly done in commercial labs, is an IgG allergy test. IgG is actually shows when a food actually causes an immune response by your body. So this immune response, again, whether it's IgG or IgA, will cause you know, your bowels to not function right. It'll cause histamine release. Your bowels now cannot absorb the pop proper amounts of water. You get loose stool or to absorb too much water. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Dr. Fred. Thanks for joining me. So 
it's very and very important to to know what's going on in your body. So IgG food tests will tell you whether you're truly having an immune related response to a food. Now, IgG responses are not only specific for bowel, but if you have migraines, if you have um, um, if you have autoimmune diseases like um, lupus or any other autoimmune disease, thi or thyroid or autoimmune diseases, a lot of these are linked to IgG immune Im mediated responses. And it could be a food like gluten is notorious for causing an IgG mediated response. You know, gluten can affect the thyroid. Um, it can affect all types of things. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm going to do a talk in a couple of weeks on something called PANDAS, which is a strep-related neurological disease, and it's caused by the antibodies caused by stress. So these antibodies wreak havoc in your body. And so if you're truly allergic to a food, you may not have an IgA or an IgE radiating response, so you may not get a rash or shortness of breath, but you may get all of these bowel symptoms or headaches or just not feeling well, fatigue. All of these things come from IgG immune radiation mediated responses. So there are labs out there that you can get. And again, I think they're mostly done in every state except for New York, where you can get an IgG uh, allergy test. And I highly recommend that. Um, so between those two tests, I could diagnose 99.5% of all people with IBS. And uh, again, it's so important to tr when you have bowel issues, think when you think bowel, think immune system. And uh, good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Stephanie. Um, it's very, very important to, to, to take these seriously because even though it might just be a nuisance and you're going to, you know, if you're constipated, just take a laxative and you have diarrhea, I'll just pop some Imodium. You have to understand that there's probably an underlying medical condition. And uh, what you need to know is there's help out there. Um, you know, there's plenty of great doctors out there. I mentioned Dr. David Dornfeld. There's another great doctor that's online right now, Dr. Fred, who's uh, very into nutrition and health, takes very good care of himself. But there's a lot of doctors out there that practice integrative medicine. I myself, I function as a, uh, as a health coach now. I do all my services online or through Zoom so we can talk face-to-face. -face. And um, what I do is I act as an advocate uh, for you, for your, you know, that can help you kind of spend more quality time with your doctor. Uh, we'll review what your problems are, we'll review uh, what your issues are, and kind of come up with, you know, a list of tests that we may want to address to see if there's anything nutritionally that we can do. And again, I work hand in hand usually with your doctor, or if you don't have a doctor, I have a network of doctors that I work with. And, um, you know, so if you have IBS and, and, and you need my help, you know, certainly reach out to me. But it's something that um, it can easily be addressed. And I've had a lot of success with people where they've even been diagnosed with, um, you know, things like um, Crohn's. And I gave you that example. Um, it's, it's very, very important to take care of your body. Um, again, I wish everybody a happy and a safe Saturday in the storm. Um, if you have any questions, you can continue to post them on this page. I will surely make my best effort to answer these questions and again um, if you have specific questions you can Facebook message me and um, if you'd like to hire me for my services as a health coach um, you know just again send me an inbox message um, it's not as expensive as you think I have packages that are available for people and um, I think that it's uh, I think it's an important thing to have an advocate, somebody who's experienced that can, you know, really help you get through some of these, you know, difficult or, you know, questions that you have about your own health. So everybody, thanks for joining me for my Saturday morning coffee. Have a happy and a healthy Saturday and um, God bless everybody. Thanks.